Hey everyone, me Kevin here. We've got to talk about why j just crashed the market. We're going to talk about the bond dump. We'll talk about commodities, real estate, some of my favorite tickers. And of course, we got to talk about what the heck j just said, which j is going to be the start of our conversation here. Just a note, this video is brought to you by two things, metkevin.com slash extra and that expiring coupon code for the amazing programs on building your wealth. Link down below. That expiration is coming up in four days and then the price goes up again. Okay, so speaking about prices going up, we just had prices go down <laughs> in the stock market. Why? What happened here? Well, we had our usual typical retail buying at the open. The last two weeks, we have seen a lot of retail buying right at market open, followed by volatility throughout the day. Usually, we've been ending up higher. Over the last week, we've been consistently ending up higher. The problem that we just had is at 9.30 in the morning, look at this drop right here, 9.30 on the dot, 9.30 right here, we get a plummet. Why? Because j Powell's speech gets released on the Federal Reserve website. All of its details get parsed by computers, spit out on the news wires, and the news wires did not like what we saw in that speech, which I'm going to explain. And there are some shifts that have happened uh, since then. Uh, then j uh, we had a little bit of a recovery after the speech was published, but after j started talking, uh, he gave his speech and then he answered some Q&A, the market rotated down a little bit more. So what is it that Jerome Powell said? Well, here are the following. This is exactly what Jerome Powell said. He said, quote, uh, if we need to go more than a 25 basis point hike, we will do so. If we need to go above neutral, we will do so. And essentially, I'm going to keep going through this, but I want to give you something that's going to make a lot more sense of this as we go through it. What Jay Powell's trying to do is he's trying to limit inflation expectations. Yesterday, I posted a video and said there are five very important things for you to track in this market. Two out of the five things I talked about yesterday were different types of inflation expectations consumer inflation expectations, which we'll get more data on at the end of this week. There'll be a new update on what consumer inflation expectations are. And number two, the market's inflation expectations, which you could track the five-year break-even chart, which has been peaking uh, uh, lately. And this is a sign of inflation expectations becoming unanchored. Multiple times during Jerome Powell's talk, he talked about the need to keep inflation expectations anchored. It's not so much of a matter that inflation is high. We know that inflation is high. Obviously, that, that, like, that's the obvious problem. But the shift in their path or sort of the course that, that they take will entirely, in my opinion, be based on inflation expectations. That is, as long as the market and consumers expect that inflation will come down, my belief is that they'll stay on the course of 11 to 17, 25 basis point hikes. That's going to take us all the way basically from zero to potentially as high as 4.25% on the Fed funds rate. And I think real estate is going to see the biggest short-term impact, uh, well, short to medium-term impact over the next really six months to two years because of this increase in rates. The stock market has already discounted a lot of the fact that rates are going to go up, that we will see rates at two and a half to three percent at the Fed uh, within the next year to year and a half and then potentially higher thereafter. By 2024, who knows if inflation stays stubborn, we could be at that four and a quarter percent with 17 rate hikes, which is exactly what we saw at the beginning of the 2000s, which j Powell referenced. j Powell references the beginning of the century as kind of how they expect to raise rates. And that's what we did in 2004 was 17 25 basis point hikes in a row. The reason the market had some heart palpitations today is because j Powell said, if we need to go more than 25 basis points, basically go 50, we will do so. And he was bluntly asked, what's stopping you from going for a 50 basis point hike now? And he said, nothing. Now, we don't actually believe that we're, they're going to go for a 50 basis point hike unless some of the expectations we have start changing. So what expectations did they lay out in the Federal Reserve meeting last week? Well, last week they told us that before Ukraine, they thought inflation would peak in March and then come down towards kind of flatten for a little bit in the summer, come down towards the end of the year. Now, and Jay Powell reiterated this today, he said, all of that has fallen apart. Their previous expectation of a peak has fallen apart. Now they believe that inflation will peak in Q3, kind of go flat for a little bit, fall more sharply in Q1 of 2023. But if that also falls apart, 
then they will hike more. And I think that's what the market here is missing is the market is freaking out because the market's hearing, oh my gosh, you said maybe we're gonna go for a 50 BP hike, but wait a minute. He said, we'll go for a 50 BP hike if the data shows that these expectations are falling apart. And so this is where I've mentioned in many videos that what you wanna pay attention to is if you wanna know if the Fed's gonna go 50, uh, this conversation didn't change anything. All it does is reiterate the fact that you've gotta look at the month over month data for CPI. We gotta see if there's a wage price spiral, which we do not have right now. We do not have a wage price spiral. We wanna watch this inflect over the coming months and of course, we want to watch the five-year break-evens, which we, I showed you already as spiking, which is a problem. This is a problem. Uh, and then we want to watch the uh, consumer sentiment inflation expectations, right? These are the, the, some of the four core things we want to be paying attention to. There are more. You can watch my video from yesterday from that. But Jerome Powell reiterated how important expectations are here and that inflation is high and that we've got to get this inflation down. In fact, here's some of the other things that he says. He says, we're at this market right now where we cannot assume that supply chains are going to provide relief. Jay Powell told us that, hey, we're starting to see some relief, maybe in like certain auto sectors, but we can't assume that supply chain relief is going to be what's going to move inflation down. He does say it doesn't all have to be the Fed, that waning fiscal support like stimulus, uh, some progress in these supply chains, and uh, maybe less reopening spending, like less travel spending, could potentially bring down inflation naturally. But they're going to respond to the data, and if the data continues to inflect in the wrong direction, and there is no Q3 peak of inflation, then they're going to hike 50. Now, j didn't give us a time frame, but Waller did. On Friday, Waller told us, that we could have a 50 basis point hike, potentially two 50 basis point hikes uh, at uh, one of the next coming two to three meetings. So that gave the market a little bit of anxiety, but Jerome Powell today reiterating that, yeah, nothing's stopping us from going 50, that I think is what led the market to be a little bit nervous today. Personally, I don't know that this is too terribly different from what he told us last week. He said he's going to be very data dependent. They have not made the decision. He reiterated that today. They have not made the decision to go with a 50 basis point hike. We recognize that inflation is too high, but uh, we're just going to respond to the incoming data. So I've already talked to you about what data to monitor. We're going to monitor this. Market's a little bit nervous about just Jay Powell even mentioning nothing stopping us about a 50, right? But let's talk about some things that are really good that he talked about. So one of the things that he was asked is, wait, what are the odds of a, of a recession? And he says, quote, I don't see a recession likelihood that is elevated. And the main reason for that is the economy is still very strong. He says, look at growth. We're at or above potential. This is reiterating what he said during the FOMC meeting in the summary of economic projections that, hey, look, we're still expecting 2.9% GDP growth. That's more than what we would have had in any period of time prior to the pandemic, uh, you know, post, post the Great Recession. So this is remarkable growth. He said the labor market is doing very, very well. And uh, that ultimately, yeah, while we're committed to restoring price stability, we at the same time want to make sure we maintain a strong labor market. And these things can go counter to each other, right? For example, if you go all in on fighting inflation, you could end up leading people to lose jobs. But you can't have inflation going forever because then, then you could end up unwinding a strong labor market, right? So a lot of complicated things to balance here. Right now, for me, I don't think much has changed beyond this. We're just going to go 25, 25, 25, 25 until and unless that data starts looking uglier, which we know March's data is already going to look ugly because of Ukraine. We're going to be paying a lot more attention to that data for the months of April, May, June, July. And maybe this is just the Fed kind of throwing it out there that, hey, just remember 50 BP is a possibility, which that makes sense. When he talked a little bit or when he was asked about the 10-2 yield curve, this is a big one. So the 10-2 continues to flatten. In fact, I'll pull up the, the new 10-2 right now. Uh, and it flattened quite a bit as well after Powell spoke. Uh, and we know that the 10-2 can be a little bit of a signal for a potential recession. In fact, anytime the 10-2 has inverted before, we've had a recession within uh, 18 months, right? The current 10-2 has a spread of about 18.8. In fact, if you just look down here under where I am, right here, 18.8 is the current spread. It's at the lowest point that it's really been at. And we're seeing 10-year treasury spike. When Jerome Powell was asked about the 10-2, he made a very interesting comment. He said, 
While he looks at the 10-2, he focuses much more on the shorter end of the curve. He focuses much more on the first 18 months. And this makes a lot of sense to me. In fact, in the video that I posted this morning, but then I made private because YouTube wasn't playing it. It was a disaster this morning. One of the things I mentioned in it is you might consider looking at the three month to the 10 year. And the reason you might want to look at that spread is because it shows you a little bit more uh, of, of uh, how the shorter portion of the curve could impact the yield curve a lot. And take a look, when you go really short, look at the yield curve over here, it, it bottomed. Uh, at, uh, at just after the invasion here in Ukraine, 224, we saw a collapse of that curve, and it's really started steepening again here. Why would the yield curve start steepening again on these sh when, when we look at the shorter ones, like the three month to the 10 year? Well, in my opinion, as markets get less fearful about the fact that, yeah, inflation's high, yeah, we're at war with Ukraine, yeah, oil prices are high, uh, yeah, gas prices are high, yeah, food prices are high, what, the more we become comfortable realizing, okay, we've got a bunch of bad news, got it. What happens? Well, people start dumping their hedges in bonds. So they start dumping the three-month bonds. They start dumping the one-year bonds and the two-year bonds. They start dumping these, and that leads the yield on those to actually go higher, faster. Why? Because when you get these uh, moving, when, when, you, when you dump the shorter term bonds, you increase the yield of the shorter term uh, bonds. That makes sense. Price goes down, yield goes up. So uh, it's interesting to me that j Powell says, hey, we like to look at the short end of the curve, like that 18 month curve, because in my opinion, what he's trying to say here is, hey, we're looking at how the market is reacting to fear. When markets are fearful, people go buy the short-term bonds. When they're less fearful, they start dumping the short-term bonds. So for me, I had a similar kind of reaction to J-Pow just had this morning in my video, which I wish was still available for you. But anyway, in the video that I posted this morning, I said, I've kind of gotten tired looking at the 10-2 yield curve because I think it's totally manipulated because of the disaster that's happening in Ukraine and people using bonds as hedges. J Pow kind of said something similar here. He said, look, we're not looking so much at the 10-2. It's a weird phenomenon. It's just one of the things we look at. We look at a lot of things. We look at PE multiples, risk spreads, uh, a broad, broad range of conditions, he says. Uh, and, and the focus really right now is, hey, we do have to focus on inflation and those inflation expectations. That's a critical piece that he talked about. And I think it's one that it's very easy for market or inflation expectations are one that are very easy for uh, markets to kind of sort of just like bypass because if inflation expectations, and this is such a weird thing, if inflation expectations are really high, then what happens? Inflation becomes self-fulfilling. This is really like a bizarre phenomenon, but basically the way this works is if you think inflation is going to be 10%, this year, 10% next year, 10% the year after, what happens? Well, you as a consumer are more likely to buy things today rather than next year. If you think inflation is going to stay around for, let's say, the next four years, 10% every single year, you're more likely to buy a computer today. You're more likely to buy a car today because you think those things are going to continue to get more expensive. Just like when we increase the price of the courses, which the next increase happens in four days, you're more likely to buy before because you want to have a lower price. This makes sense. But what that actually does is it reiterates, it sort of self-fulfills inflation in broader markets. When people know that prices are going to go up, they move their purchases up. And what happens? Well, now the market overall sees more inflation. And this is why the two massive things the Fed pays attention to are not just what actually the inflation rate is. Write that down. So what is the current rate of CPI? but it's also those expectations. And we have those two ways, which we talked about earlier in this video, to measure those expectations. And those are things like looking at the five-year break-evens and of course, the uh, consumer sentiment inflation uh, expectations, right? Which on Friday, we'll get new numbers on this. The five-year break-even, you could just watch the chart on every single day. And, and that is a chart that has been steepening. So when Powell comes out and we have these Fed speak periods, which we talked about this in the course member live stream, this morning, there are a lot of, there's a lot of Fed speak coming up. I'll give you the calendar really quick here. It is, oh, it's on this phone. Uh, when the Fed comes out to speak, what they're really trying to do is they're trying to manipulate expectations down to make sure that uh, people don't basically let these inflation expectations get unanchored. Because once inflation expectations go unanchored, what happens? You end up having to force a recession. The Federal Reserve 
remember this, can wave a wand and force a recession. Unfortunately, that comes at the cost of high unemployment, so it hurts poor people even more, which is a problem, or, or even, even medium income people. But look at the schedule that we have. Uh, Bostic spoke this morning. Uh, Powell just spoke. We've got Daly speaking tomorrow. Mester speaks tomorrow. Bullard speaks on Wednesday. He's he's a pretty big hawk. Uh, Kashkari speaks on Thursday. Evan speaks on Thursday. And then we get our consumer expectations on the 25th, which is Friday. And Barkin also discusses inflation on the 25th. So you've got a whole week of the Federal Reserve coming out and giving us this kind of nonsense. So expect a lot of volatility this week, uh, which previously I wasn't expecting. I thought this would have been a little bit more of a calm week, but with this Fed speak schedule, it's just gonna be more and more of these Fed headlines. So, okay, so we talked about j we talked about the bond dump, we talked about, oh, now we gotta talk about real estate commodities and some stocks. So I wanna touch on real estate. This, this rise in the 10 year curve is a problem for real estate. Remember, I've previously and many times before on this channel said that I believe the 10 year treasury bond is going to run uh, up to 3%. And uh, let me tell you about what that means for real estate. But I do wanna give a quick message and shout out to our sponsor today, and that is Extra. Uh, remember, if you wanna get into real estate, you gotta have a good credit score. And one of the neat things about the Extra debit card is it kinda gives you the credit of having a credit card without actually having the risk of having a credit card. The way it works is you go to metkevin.com slash extra, sign up, link this to your existing bank account. And then when you spend money on this card, uh, extra will pay themselves back the next business day. And then they'll report those balances they lent you essentially over the night, over business night. They'll report those balances as paid to the credit bureaus. And it says, if you can grow your credit score by using a debit card without having the risks of a credit card. They've also got a rewards program, which is amazing. Go learn more about extra at metkevin.com slash extra. Okay, so let's talk about real estate. Well, you gotta look at the 10-year treasury. And this morning when, when I woke up, I look, I go, oh gosh, man, the 10-year went to 2.24%. To Remember, I've been shorting the 10-year treasuries. I've been shorting them since under 2% because I'm like, these things are going well over 2%. Now, I closed my short on the 10-year treasury. I should have closed it today. I would have had you know, a little bit more profit on it, maybe another one or 2%, big deal. But the point is, like directionally, these 10 years keep going up. Look at them now. They're 2 point, almost 3%. This is insane. Tomorrow, we're gonna see the highest mortgage rates that we have seen since 2018. And I tell you, I think this is just the beginning. I think we're going to go back to that three year, 10 year treasury yield. I don't think it's all going to happen immediately. In the short term, I wouldn't be surprised to see this 10 year fluctuate between 2.1 and like 2.5% fluctuate around. But over the medium term, which is like six to 18 months, it wouldn't surprise me to see us go back to that 3%, which would be equivalent the equivalent of about a five to five and a quarter percent mortgage rate. And I think we're going to see headwinds against the real estate market, probably in the neighborhood of 20, 25% in sapped purchasing power. That doesn't mean prices will go down that much. I think that'll just offset all of this excess demand that we have in real estate. And maybe we only end up seeing like a sort of a, a soft move down in real estate prices somewhere in the direction of five, 10% until rates start coming down again, which we expect rates will start coming down again, probably end of 2024, maybe 2025, something like that. Uh, so that's something to keep an eye on. Remember, j Powell tells us no risk of recession. Uh, we've just got to make sure we keep those inflation expectations anchored. But yeah, we are going to go up just like we did at the beginning of the 2000s. Many rate increases over time. And so this is a headwind that I definitely see for real estate. Okay, so we talked about j -Pow. We talked about the bond dump and, and how complicated these bonds are being right now. Talked about real estate. I do briefly wanna look at some of the individual charts that we're seeing here. So this is the NASDAQ. Obviously, we were having a pretty decent day sitting around that 38.2% Fibonacci uh, until j -Pow started talking and he really pushed us right back down. Uh, we're sitting right now about 348, still nicely above that. Uh, well, actually, we're, we're just barely below the... Um, 38.2 uh, Fibonacci here. So we're still moving nicely up. And uh, for me, a lot of folks are asking me, Kevin, when would you short in this market again? I'm not really interested in shorting or hedging to the downside until I see the indices get back to about that 61 to 78% retracement. When we get back into this territory, or imagine we get some crazy euphoric week or something, and we get into this territory over here, this is when I think it's gonna make sense to, to short the market. Uh, or to at least hedge, because I don't really, like it's gonna take a lot 
for us to get back to this 318 QQQ in my opinion. We've already got so much freaking bad news priced in uh, that, that it's gonna take a lot to really push us down and keep us down in my opinion. And that's why I think also today you're, yeah, we saw a little bit of a push down, but we're no lower than where we were this morning on just typical trading uh, and, and no news from the Fed, right? So really we've, we've gone nowhere is, is really what it feels like here, which is fine. So where are the opportunities? Well, if you believe a recession is coming, you do not want to be in the stock. I have said this since I originally uh, started talking about the stock. You do not want to be in a firm holdings if you think we are going into a recession. However, if you think, like Jerome Powell, that the odds of a recession are low, in an inflationary time, a company like a firm could actually do quite well. The reason a company like a firm could actually do quite well is, first of all, we've barely retraced anything off the bottom here, which if anything gives you a, a greater potential fear factor that does it mean that we've actually hit a bottom here on a firm, right? Could a firm go even lower? It absolutely could, especially if the market price is in more of a risk of a recession. But I have a belief that uh, in an inflationary time, absent a recession, people are going to be more likely to want to use things like the Affirm debit card and do essentially use buy now, pay later services on things like, uh, you know, their general purchases, which you could then apply using the, uh, the Affirm debit card to a sort of buy now, pay later plan. Uh, now, I don't recommend this, but I also don't think the people who use this stuff watch my videos. I, I really don't recommend people spend money they don't have ever. Uh, you know, I, some people are like, hey, Kevin, I really like the fact that I could check out for your courses with PayPal and do buy and, uh, you know, pay in four or whatever. I'm like, w whatever. I don't recommend it. But if you want to use that, you can. So uh, I think if we're in an inflationary time, absent a recession, there could be an opportunity to invest in a company like a firm and probably see them come back to this 38 to 50 percent Fibonacci here, no guarantees. Certainly not this insane euphoria that we had over here at like 177, 143. I was a seller of a firm over in this area here because it was just pure euphoria. But somewhere at this midpoint uh, retracement, I see that. We're kind of already seeing those midpoint retracements in stocks like Enphase already above the 38.2. We're seeing that sort of midpoint retracement on stocks like Tesla also already over that 38.2. Uh, and so there is some argument that maybe it makes sense to look at other companies like uh, even Roblox or Firm or whatever that just still haven't even gotten to their first level of retracement. Just be careful with these. I would, I would keep these at lower portions of your portfolio. A bigger concern that I actually have, though, is this the consumer discretionary spend in general. And that would be like your Shopify. So Shopify is another one that's really struggling. Uh, to, to go anywhere. And the reason here, in my opinion, just like j Powell said, is people are probably more likely to save money or spend less money just like the Chinese are doing. Why? Because uh, we're at a very uncertain time. Gas prices are high. Food prices are high. Everything's getting more expensive. And so it's likely that you would spend less money on Shopify or Etsy, right? And see, look, this is why Etsy continues to get rejected by the 23.6. Consumers are going to be a little bit weaker. The same is going to be true of the lending platforms. Uh, to some degree, that includes uh, Square and PayPal, but probably to a more greater degree, it includes the uh, uh, student loan company and mortgager uh, SoFi. Uh, you know, they've also got their brokerage division, which all three of those things, mortgages, student loans, and brokeraging, like Robinhood kind of stuff, right? Trading. I think all three of those are, have huge anchors on their business, which is not great. People who have made new accounts for savings via SoFi or PayPal or Square probably already did so during the stimulus era. Now it's really tough. People are spending even more money to try to get more customers here. And this is why I'm purposefully trying to stay away from some of the lending companies. I'm trying to stay or, or at least limit my exposure to them uh, because I do have a little bit of SoFi just like I have a little bit of Palantir. Uh, but I'm trying to limit my exposure to them and I'm trying to go heavier when I get little dips uh, uh, especially if I get under 60 on Trade Desk, I'm really trying to pick up a lot of Trade Desk under 60. Uh, the reason for that is because I really think we're going to see a big move into advertising. And uh, as, as companies try to spend more money, either partnering with companies like Affirm for Buy Now, Pay Later, or advertising companies to fight for the consumers who are willing to spend. So these are just some ideas that I have in terms of stocks that I'm watching. Obviously, I'm also keeping an eye on what's happening with uh, Occidental Petroleum here. It is now at another all-time high over here. Uh, I mean, I shouldn't say all-time high, post-2018 uh, post kind of high. 
And uh, it, this, this, in my opinion, has a lot of retail momentum in it. In fact, it's not even just my opinion. I could tell you what the most popular retail stocks are right now. They are, yep, okay. So retail, trading flows, Alibaba, NEO, Occidental, XLE. Uh, you're actually seeing some expansion over, uh, some buy the dip on Jets, which I'd be a little bit more careful about that one. One I do agree with personally would be like a Taiwan Semiconductors. Talked about them on my video yesterday. But I do think that commodities like USO, wheat, corn, Occidental, uh, these are going to see a peak at some point. Uh, I've got a Fibonacci drawn over here on uh, USO, and I'm looking for an opportunity to probably short USO if we end up somewhere between the 61.8 to 78.6 Fib over here, uh, because I, I don't think we're going to get to the same sort of peak fear moment we had up here, but uh, certainly somewhere in the 80s for USO is going to be a, p a potential opportunity to short, unless, of course, you expect commodities to keep going. Keep your shorts small, though, uh, because, uh, you know, you, you Shorts can get be, it can be very dangerous, but again, in terms of real downside protection, I'm waiting until uh, the QQQ and Spy get a little bit more euphoric. Uh, today's sort of hemming and hawing here, not a surprise to me that the market's taking a little bit of a breather after uh, JPOW comes out and just even mentions, hey, nothing's stopping us from doing the 50 BP hike. But really, in my opinion, this is his way of trying to arm wrestle those inflation expectations down. That's the whole point of him coming out and yapping is to try to make the markets price in less inflation so that way they don't actually have to hike 50. So that's my thesis. Anyway, uh, if you found this video helpful, consider sharing it. Make sure to check out Extra by going to metkevin.com slash extra. Check out the programs on building your wealth, metkevin.com slash join, also linked down below. And uh, thanks so much for being here. We'll see you in the very next one. Thanks again. Goodbye.